I'm pressing on the upward way. No high Sunday in every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. By faith on heaven's stable land. A higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. You see the chorus? Yeah. I, I want a higher plane. We're not satisfied with where we are. You know, a lot of people get satisfied with, uh, I'm okay. We want a higher plane. That's right. That's why we're going to have a man preach on the King James Bible tonight. Amen. 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 On the second stanza now. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound. My prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, let me out and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land. A higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world, though Satan's ours. At me are hurled, for faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I'm found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane that I come from the same stuff. I was telling the men out, or I told the pastor out, out in the prayer meeting, I said, you know what? I can hear tonight. He said, what was the trouble? I said, I forgot to turn the volume up on my hearing aid. <laughs> he says, you know, I was trying to weed wax some weeds, and I couldn't get the thing started. And then I said, oh, I have to turn it on. Turn it on. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, we came from the same stuff. <laughs> All right, I've got one more here. How about the number 579? Banner of the Cross. 579. Okay. All set? 579, the Banner of the Cross. There's a royal banner given for display to the soldiers of the king. As an ensign fair we lift it up today, while as ransom once we sing. Marching on, marching on, for Christ down everything but lost. challenge you to do something. You know, right here where the chorus starts, you know, marching on, we, we go marching on, but then there's a little on, on. So if somebody was bringing that second, uh, I don't know what you call it, but uh, you know, marching on, 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 marching on, 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 you know, okay. Let's, uh, Second stanza. All right, here we go. Though foe may rage 
and gather as the flood, let the standard be displayed. And beneath his foes as soldiers of the Lord, for the truth be not dismayed. Here we go now. Marching on, on marching on, 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 for Christ counts everything but loss. And around him king will toil and sing beneath the banner of the cross. <coughs> Over land and sea, wherever men may dwell, make the glorious tidings known. Of the crimson banner, now the story tell, while the Lord shall claim his own. Marching on, on, marching on, 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 for Christ counts everything but loss. And to crown him king, toil and sing, beneath the banner of the cross. He's doing good. When the glory <coughs> dawns, his dawning hurry near, is hastening day by day. Before our King, the foe shall disappear, and the cross the world shall sway. Marching on, marching on, for Christ counts everything but love's glory. And crown him King, toil and sing beneath the banner of the cross. It comes from the heart. All right, Pastor, we're all set. All right, Bill, now, you need to calm down just a little bit. We're Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> you said you came from a shop. <laughs> uh, Bill, I like to see you get excited. I like to see people get excited. Like I said this morning, we can get excited over ball games, can't we? Yeah, yes. how about that? So we just can't get excited over the Bible. Mm -hmm. All right, John's going to come and give us some material on why we use which Bible? The old King James Bible. Mm -hmm. okay. So, John, you come, and I think he is. Uh, filming it back there, so if you miss something tonight, you might be able to go on his website or something and read and listen to it. Yes, sir. All right, you yes, tell sir. us how to do that. Amen, I sure will. Well, praise the Lord. It's wonderful to be here with you tonight. Thank you once again for the opportunity to come and preach and uh, share the Word of God with you this evening. Mm -hmm. um, originally, this was uh, planned for a uh, four-Wednesday uh, night uh, setup, mm -hmm. and so we were going to cover this throughout the month of March. Uh, the pastor uh, made mention to me that some folks have to work on Wednesdays and may not be able to be here. And so we thought that it might be more prudent to do this on Sunday nights. Um, every other Sunday night, I'm preaching over at True Vine Baptist Church, so we can't do this every Sunday night. I'll, I'll be with them the next week, but back with you folks the week following. And so we'll kind of go back and forth uh, here for the next uh, several weeks here until we get uh, the subject uh, covered. Um, I do anticipate four messages uh, as far as the series is concerned. Um, uh, I had never thought about a fifth one for like a question and answer. That's, uh, that's actually a great idea. Uh, you know, let me say, first of all, uh, that I don't know everything that there is to know about this subject. Uh, oh. But by the grace of God, uh, <laughs> I have been saved for 31 years. And uh, when I first got saved, I got saved in a good Bible-believing church where the emphasis was very strongly on why the King James Bible is the Word of God. And so from my youth up into the Lord to the present, this is an issue that I have studied and spent a lot of, a lot of time on. And so I don't profess to be all-knowing by any means. Uh, none of us are. I don't care how long you've been preaching. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, by the grace of God, this is a subject that is uh, near and dear uh, to my heart. So tonight we're going to lay just a bit of a foundation. Um, you're not really going to get a whole lot about why the King James as far as tonight's message. Tonight's message is laying a foundation for the Word of God itself. And then from that foundation, in the next couple of messages, we're going to build on the King James. Uh, the next message, uh, for example, tonight is going to, the name of tonight's message is Final Authority. Why Final Authority is an important issue. Um, and then uh, the next message will be specifically why I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. And then the third message is going to be the Bible checklist. 
And I'm going to bring some other versions of the Bible in here, and I'm going to pass them out amongst the congregation. And we're going to go through a checklist, and we're going to compare Bibles with Bibles. We're also going to look at the errors uh, of the new versions uh, that once again demonstrates the, the superiority of the King James. And then uh, I'm going to blow your minds with the last message, because the last message is entitled, The Advanced Revelations of God's Authorized Version. Uh, and in that uh, 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 particular sermon, I'm going to show you the superiority of the these and thous, the superiority of the italicized words, and why the King James Bible, in many ways, gives you revelations from God that you couldn't find, even if you could read. read, read. Yeah. And so uh, I think that last message, uh, uh, that's the one we want to get to, uh, but we got to build up to that to get there. Amen? Amen. And so uh, if you would tonight, take your Bibles and come to uh, Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter uh, 21, I kind of let the cat out of the bag this evening. Uh, tonight's message is on the subject of final authority. Matthew chapter 21. In Matthew chapter 21, if you'll come with me please to verse number 23, the Bible says, And when he was come into the temple, this of course referring to Jesus, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, by what authority doest thou these things, and who gave thee this authority? Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, I will likewise tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? Now right off the bat here, he puts the Pharisees in a difficult spot. Look what it says. It says, And they reason with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. Let's pray. Our Father in God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings and for your goodness and mercy. Thank you, Lord, for Little Creek Baptist Church. Father, thank you for Pastor Wade Smith and his wife, Nora, for their many faithful years of service uh, to Hampton Roads with this church. Thank you, Lord, for the beacon of light that this church has been to so many. Thank you for each person that's gathered here tonight and each person that may watch as far as the video that's being filmed. Father, we pray that the word of God might be exalted. And Father, we pray the Lord Jesus Christ might be lifted up to the place of preeminence that he's worthy of. And Father, we pray that every heart might be blessed. And Lord, I pray that your people tonight might learn some things about your word that would be a blessing to their hearts. And Lord, we'll thank you for all these things. For it's in Jesus' precious name we pray and ask. Amen. 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 By what authority doest thou these things, and who gave thee that authority? You see, final authority has always been the issue. Final authority is still the issue, and final authority always will be the issue. <coughs> who gets to tell who what to do? Who's in charge? Who has the final word? You know, you look here in the United States as far as our political system and so forth, we have three branches of government, and they're supposedly three co-equal branches, but they all like to step on each other's toes from time to time. Uh, we've got the executive branch, which is the president and all of his cabinet secretaries. Uh, we've got the legislative branch as far as Congress, the House and the Senate. And then we have the judicial branch. And within the judicial branch, the top of the food chain is the Supreme Court. And so uh, whenever the president takes executive action that someone doesn't like, or uh, when Congress passes legislation that someone doesn't like, uh, they'll route that thing, uh, thing through the judicial system. And ultimately, when it reaches the, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court is called the Supreme Court because they're supposed to be the final arbiter of what's legal and what's constitutional and what's not. Mm -hmm. And so for the child of God, the Bible is the final authority. The Bible is the Supreme Court. There is nothing higher than the Scripture. You know, uh, tonight as Christians, the things we believe, we don't believe them because the seminary said so. Right. Uh, we don't believe because a, a denomination said so. The things we believe, the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, the blood atonement, uh, the uh, infallibility of Scripture, uh, you know, uh, the second coming of Christ, all those key fundamental doctrines, the reason why we believe those things is because God said so. And the Bible says, let God be true, but every man a liar. So the final authority for the believer is the word of God. Now, the problem is this. 
Here in 2019, there's probably about two or three hundred different English translations that claim to be the Word of God. Yeah. And the problem is not all of them say the same thing. Yeah. Now, most of them say Holy Bible on the cover. Um, most of them claim to be the Bible. But when you line these Bibles up together and look at them, they are not saying the same things. Therefore, somebody has to be right and somebody has to be wrong because two things which are different cannot both be right. right. And so the purpose of this series is to either A, help you to be informed about why the King James Bible is the Word of God, or B, if you've never been persuaded to that position, my goal is to bring you to that position before this thing is over with. Amen. Now, as far as final authority, this thing got started all the way back in the Garden of Eden. Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and come to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Now, in Genesis chapter 2, God has created man. He's planted a garden in Eden, and he's commissioned the man to care for this garden. And he's planted this particular tree in the garden. And of this tree, he says, of all the trees in the garden, you may freely eat. But of that one right there, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I want you to leave that one alone, because in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And so uh, look what he says here. Uh, come to verse uh, 15 of chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest, what? Freely eat. Do you see that word freely? Yeah. It's very important. Remember that word freely. We're going to come back to that in just a minute. Thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Right. So God has planted this garden. He's commissioned Adam to take care of the garden, but he's put this particular tree, and he says, look, of all the other trees, you can eat of those things freely, but of that one right there, leave it alone. Because in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die, right? Yeah. And so come over to chapter 3 now. Now since uh, that commandment has been given, uh, God has caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. He's taken one of his ribs and he's formed the woman. And so now uh, Adam has a wife. And of course her name is Eve. And it says in chapter 3 verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. That means he was a Democrat, amen. No, I'm just kidding. I know I shouldn't get political like that, but I can't help myself. It's a flaw in my flesh. Y'all pray for it. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? You know, the first question that's ever asked in the Bible is right there. It's asked by the devil. And the question that is asked, the motivation for it being asked is to bring doubt upon what God said. Right. Did you ever stop to think about that? Matter of fact, when you look at the Bible, look at Genesis, look at Job, uh, look at the New Testament, Matthew and Mark, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Matthew and Luke. Uh, do you realize that every time the devil speaks in the Bible, he speaks with a question? He never makes a declarative statement in either testament. Every time he ever talks, he's asking a question. And every time he ever talks, he's trying to bring doubt on the word of God. Here he says, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? He's calling into question what God said. Now look at the woman, verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Hello, Houston, we have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. Notice that Eve has committed a critical, tactical error. She has changed what God said. And when the devil sees that you don't know what God said, he knows he's got you. God didn't say, ye may eat of every tree of the garden. He said, ye may freely eat of every tree of the garden. Remember when he gave that commandment to, uh, to Adam? Ye may freely eat. Uh, Satan already right off the bat sees that Eve doesn't know her Bible because she has subtracted from the word of God. Right. Now, she probably did this in innocence. She probably didn't do this maliciously, but the devil knows he has her where he wants her. Mm -hmm. Look what it says. Verse 3. But of the fruit of the tree of, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it. Watch it now. Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, hold on just a second. 
We read chapter 2 before we came to chapter 3. Yeah. Did God say anything about touching that tree? No. Never said nothing about that, did he? So she's omitted something God did say, and now she's added something God didn't say. Yeah. And so right off the bat, the devil knows he's got her. Because when you start subtracting from the Word of God, and when you start adding to the Word of God, you find yourself in a mess every time. Yeah. Now, the first sin in the Bible, uh, no doubt, is them disobeying God. Right. As far as uh, disobeying Him by eating of the fruit that God said not to eat of, that's where the first sin came from. But notice the prerequisite that led to that sin was changing the Word of God. I want to submit unto you tonight that if you've got an NIV Bible, it adds to the Word of God and it subtracts from the Word of God. Yeah. If you've got an ESV Bible, you've got a Bible that adds to the Word of God and subtracts from the Word of God. Uh, I'll even go so far as to say if you've got a new King James Version, yeah. you have a Bible that adds to the Word of God and subtracts from the Word of God. Amen. And so uh, by the grace of God for the last year and a uh, a month, I guess, about 13 months. I've worked at Lifeway Christian Bookstore over in uh, Chesapeake. And boy, have I built, uh, built a reputation for myself in that store. Uh, uh, the other associates, they know when someone has something to ask about the Bible, go ask John. <laughs> uh, be, because uh, they know that I'm going to tell them the truth as far as which version of the Bible is the right version. Mm -hmm. And so by the grace of God, there's been some folks that uh, came in uh, uh, desiring to buy this translation or that translation, and by the grace of God, they walked out with the right book. Amen. Amen. And so, praise the Lord for that opportunity. I think God's put me there for that express purpose. And so, uh, uh, in chapter 3, though, we see this issue of final authority. What did God say, and did he mean what he said? And I want to submit unto you that God has said what he meant, and he meant what he said, and we better not mess with God's book. Amen. Right. Now, we'll get to that a little bit later. Now, uh, as far as the Word of God is concerned and as far as final authority, the final authority in all matters of faith and practice for the believer of necessity is the Word of God. But why? Why is the Word of God the final authority in all matters of faith and practice? And I want to give you four uh, quick thoughts, and then we'll go eat some chicken and dumplings. Amen? <laughs> Number one, I want to say this. The Word of God is the final authority because of inspiration. Right. Because of inspiration. If you would, please, take your Bibles and come to 2 Timothy chapter uh, 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul is speaking to his young protege, Timothy, and he discusses the subject of the Scriptures. And look what he says here, 2 Timothy chapter 3. I draw your attention uh, to verse number 14. 2 Timothy 3, verse 14. Here the Bible says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now do you see that? That from a child thou hast known what? Scriptures. The holy scriptures. For most of you, on the front of your Bible, it says Holy Bible on the front. And if it doesn't say it on the front, it says it on the spine as far as Holy Bible. And I want you to understand that there's only one thing this side of heaven that you can hold in your hands, that you can touch and feel and lay your eyes upon, and that's this book right here. That is the only holy thing this side of heaven. Uh, listen here. The Catholics talk about having holy water. Uh, the Mormons talk about having holy underwear. Uh, the Pentecostal holiness, they talk about uh, being holy and all that stuff. But I've got you to understand tonight that there's only one thing you can lay your eyes on, lay your hands on, and hold in your lap, and that's the Word of God tonight. Amen. That's the only holy thing. He called the Scriptures holy. Uh, you're not holy and neither am I. That's why I love the Bible. It's everything that I'm not. It's everything that I'm not because it's holy and it's true and I'm not. I'm a sinner saved by grace. If I got what I deserve tonight, I wouldn't be standing in a pulpit talking to you folks and you folks listening to me. If I got what I deserve tonight, I'd be in a lake of fire with my back broke, with the smoke of my torment ascending up forever and ever, crying out for a drink of water that would never come right. if I got what I deserved. Yeah. 
But by the grace of God and because of the fact the Lord Jesus Christ died for my sins according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again the third day for my justification, he paid my penalty with his own shed blood and saved me and gave me the gift of eternal life and he recorded it all down in a book so I could know about it and you're going to try to take my book away from me? I don't think so. You're not taking my book away from me. You might take a lot of things from me. You ain't taking my book. You ain't taking my faith in an infallible, inerrant, inspired word of God that's the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Amen. He says here that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now watch verse 16. All scripture. Do you know what all means in the Greek? Everything. Means all. Everything. So not some. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. The word inspiration means God breathed. It came out as the breath of God itself. You'll hear people say, well, men wrote the Bible. Uh, yes, yeah. men wrote the Bible in the sense that they were the instruments of God. Uh, it's no different than you sitting down at a computer and typing on a keyboard or taking a pen in your hand and putting pen to paper. Uh, listen here. The author is not the pen. Uh, the author is not the keyboard on the computer. You are the author when you do such things. So likewise, Moses and David and John and Peter and all the authors of the Bible, they were not the authors. They were the instruments that God used right. to communicate his word. Right. Yep. Look with me, if you will, please. Uh, over at uh, uh, Psalm 45. Psalm 45. I'll give you an example. Psalm 45. This is a wedding psalm. This is a prophecy of Christ in the church as far as the marriage supper of the Lamb. And here the psalmist, uh, which uh, uh, we don't know exactly who wrote it. It doesn't tell us. But he says here, uh, Psalm 45, 1, My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue, my tongue, my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. And so the psalmist, whoever this psalmist was for this psalm, understood the fact that God was speaking through them. And that's how inspiration works. Inspiration is God working through human vessels to communicate his word. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now let's look at how this process of inspiration works. Uh, take your Bibles, please, and come to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Yes, we are going to be turning to several scriptures, not just tonight. But on all the subsequent messages as well, it's important for you to understand uh, this is not something uh, that Brother John has made up. Uh, this is not Brother John giving you opinions. Uh, this is what the Word of God says. This is the final authority of Scripture itself. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Now you remember the story of the Mount of Transfiguration. I think we've talked about that before. Uh, you remember how Peter, James, and John uh, went up uh, into the mount with Jesus. And while he was there, the Bible says he was transfigured before them. Uh, uh, here's this 30-ish uh, year old uh, Jewish carpenter with uh, black uh, hair like a raven, eyes like a dove, that olive ruddy complexion that a typical Middle Eastern Jew has. But just for a few seconds, uh, deity began to seep through that flesh, and he was transfigured before him. Uh, them, uh, uh, his uh, raven became white like snow. Uh, his sun began to shine as the sun in its strength, and they fell on their faces before him. And then even Moses and Elijah showed up. Uh, it was such a, a, a paramount uh, event in their lives that John makes reference to it in 1 John chapter 1, and Peter talks about it here in 2 Peter chapter 1. It's something they never forgot. Uh, it was a foundational moment in the lives of those men. And he says here in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, well, look at verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Uh, listen here, folks. Uh, we're not following something that was made up. Uh, this thing's not a fairy tale. That's what Peter's saying. He says, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. 
Uh, we're not telling you what someone told us. We're telling you what we saw with our own eyes. And he says, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Now watch verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whoa. Hold on a second, Peter. What are you talking about? You saw Jesus transfigured. You saw his deity. You heard the voice of God from heaven saying, this is my beloved son and whom I'm well pleased. You've got something better than that. Verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. I've got something better for you, fellas, than my eyewitness testimony. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Men didn't write what they just wanted to write. Didn't come by the will of man. But <coughs> holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. How about that? Yes. Do you see that? Yes. Do you see that it didn't say holy men of God wrote as they were moved by the Holy Ghost? It didn't say they wrote. It says they spake. Why is that important? Because sometimes the author of Scripture spoke and somebody else wrote it down. And then other times they wrote it down with their own hand. Watch this now. Take your Bibles and come to 2 Samuel chapter 23. It's 2 Samuel 23 in one hand and Jeremiah 36 in the other. 2 Samuel 23 and then uh, Jeremiah 36 in the other. Now in 2 Samuel, David has come to the end of his life. David's about to check out. He's about to be gathered to his fathers. And in 2 Samuel chapter 23... It says, these be the last words of David. Now, not his literal last words, as far as the last words that ever came out of his mouth, but his last recorded words. It says, these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, and the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel. How many psalms are there? 150, right? How many did David write? A little bit of Bible trivia for you. 73 that we know. And he may have written more because some of the Psalms are anonymous, and David may have written some of those. But there are at least 73 that bear his name. And so that means of the 150 Psalms, David wrote nearly half of them. And he may have written more than half of them for all we know. But he was the sweet psalmist of Israel. Now watch verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me. Watch it now. And his word was in my tongue. You know what you call that? You call that inspiration. Yeah. Inspiration. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The spirit of the Lord spake by me and his word was in my tongue. And so David acknowledged the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Uh, you ever stop to think about David writing the 22nd Psalm? You know, the 22nd Psalm, uh, they pierced my hands and my feet. Yeah. Now, you can search the Bible a million years with a laser beam, and you'll never find a time where David got his hands and his feet pierced. Right. Now, of course, that was a prophecy of the crucifixion. You know, uh, in, the, in the very Psalm, he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's what Jesus said on the cross. Yeah. How did David know about that a thousand years before Calvary? Yeah. The inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Right. The Spirit of God spake by him and God's word was in his tongue. Hmm. And it showed up in places like Psalm 22. Hmm. Inspiration. And so sometimes the author spoke the word and somebody else wrote it down. Though. Look at Jeremiah 36. Jeremiah 36. There's a wide range to this thing called inspiration. Jeremiah chapter 36. 
Jeremiah chapter 36. And it came to pass, verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 36, verse 1. And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, page stuck together, uh, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel, and against Judah, and against all the nations, from the day I spake unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. It may be uh, that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Then Jeremiah called Barak, the son of Neriah, and Barak wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of a book. And so God gave the word to Jeremiah. Jeremiah spoke the word. And Barak there, he sat there and listened to Jeremiah speak. And he wrote down everything Jeremiah said. And there's where you got the book of Jeremiah, friend. Amen. God spoke through Jeremiah and Barak wrote it down. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now there's opposition to the word of God today. Do you think that there was opposition to the word of God back in that day? Yeah. Sure there was. Yeah. If you read the rest of this chapter here, uh, the word that, uh, that Barak wrote down, it gets out to the public officials, to the king and to his cabinet and so forth. And let me tell you, they are none too happy about what Jeremiah has to say because it's a negative sermon against them. And the world doesn't like negative preaching. If you'll preach like Joel Olstein, you can fill up a football stadium. As long as you've got pretty hair and pretty teeth. <laughs> But if you've got a receding hairline like I got and got buck teeth, this is what you get. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. But seriously, if you sugarcoat things, you can fill up a football stadium. But if you tell people the truth, you're going to have a small following. Most Bible-believing churches are small. Now, some may be a little bigger than this, but they're still small. Thousands and thousands aren't breaking down the doors to get into the Bible-believing churches that are left here in America. Right. That's just how it is. You know, uh, I saw a meme on Facebook the other day that made me chuckle because it said, uh, too much sugar-coated preaching leads to truth decay. Truth decay. <laughs> truth decay. Too much sugar-coated preaching leads to truth decay. I was scared. Uh, we need to have some negative preaching sometimes. Now, I'm not saying all the time, but the Bible says to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and, uh, long and doctrine. Reprove, negative. Rebuke, negative. Yeah. Exhort, positive. That means if you're in a Bible-believing church, probably about two-thirds to uh, uh, two of what you hear is probably negative. Because the preacher's having to talk about what's going on in the world. Here, recently, Pastor Smith had to address this abortion issue that's going on uh, you know, here in Virginia as far as our governor. Uh, you know, uh, Wanting to not just abort babies in the womb, but to abort them after they're born. Right. What is here? As a preacher of the gospel, you can't stand by and not say something about that. Amen. And so here a couple weeks ago, he had to address that issue. Uh, nobody wants to address the negative, but if you're a God-called preacher, sometimes you yeah. know you have to. Yeah. And so that's what happened here in Jeremiah 36. Uh, the negative preaching uh, gets things uh, stirred up. Uh, it gets them so upset. Look what happens here. Um, look at verse 22. Here in Jeremiah 36, look what happens. And the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month, and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. And it came to pass that when Jehudi had, heard, had read three or four leaves, he cut it with the penknife and cast it into the hearth that was or in the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. They get so mad at the word of God, they can't stand what Jeremiah had to say so much, they cut it up with a knife and throw it in the fire. Yeah. And look what it says in the next verse, verse 24. Yet they were not afraid nor rent their garments, neither the king nor any of his servants that heard all these words. They had such a lack of respect for the word of God, they weren't even afraid about what they had done. Hey folks, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you don't fear God, you just don't have much sense. Look what it says at the end of the chapter though, verse 32. Then took Jeremiah another roll. <laughs> then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Barak, the scribe, the son of Neriah, and wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim king of Judah had burned in the fire, and there were added besides unto them many like words. 
Hello, italicized words. <laughs> you ever heard someone tell you that the italicized words in the King James Bible are not inspired? Yeah. Don't worry, in the fourth message, I'll show you why they are. And there's a proof text that we'll be coming back to. Because it says there that not only did Barak write down all the former words of the first roll, it says he added unto them many like words also. And so uh, you can't destroy the word of God. And you can't destroy the word of God because of preservation. And we'll get to that here in just a moment. But we're not done with inspiration just yet. Now take your Bibles now and come to Romans chapter 1. Get Romans chapter 1 in one hand and get Romans chapter 16 in the other. So get the first chapter and get the last chapter. Romans chapter 1. Still talking about this thing of inspiration. All scriptures given by inspiration of God. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Romans chapter 1. Now the title of the book in your Bible probably says something like this. The Epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Romans. Is that what everyone's Bible says? The Epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Romans. Now look at verse number 1. Chapter 1 verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. Do you see that? Yes. All right, so who's the author of this book? Paul, right? In the very first verse, the very first word of the, uh, of the book, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. So Paul is the author, or is he? Look at chapter 16. Come to chapter 16. Here in chapter 16, uh, Paul is uh, sending salutations to several different people. And look what it says in verse number 22. Chapter 16, verse 22. In 16.22, he says this. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. I remember when I first got saved, I was 19 years old. And I read that, and I thought that I'd found something that nobody else had ever found. I said, oh no, I have found a mistake in the Bible. Because here Romans 1.1 1, 1 says that Paul wrote this thing. And then here in 16.22 it says, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle. And so I was all kind of concerned about this thing. Because I thought that I'd found a mistake in the Bible. No, the mistake was me, not the book. Let me give you a word of advice. Anytime you think you found something wrong with the Bible, the problem is you, it's not the Bible. If you'll keep that line of thinking, you'll do okay. <laughs> There's no mistake here. There's no error. Paul spoke the word under the inspiration of God. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Tertius, who is Paul's secretary, executive assistant, or whatever they're calling him these days, just like Barak did for Jeremiah, Tertius did the same for Paul and wrote down what Paul said, and that's where we get the epistle to the Romans. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Sometimes, though, somebody else wrote it down. And so the theological term is an amanuensis. Uh, an amanuensis, and that's a $5 theological term. Uh, people use words like that because they know words you don't know so that you'll think that they're smart. You know, if you got a bellyache and you go to the doctor, he doesn't tell you that you've got a bellyache. He tells you that you've got a gastroenteritis. Why? Because if he said you had a bellyache, he couldn't charge you $100 for the visit. There you go. So he's got to call it a gastroenteritis because, oh, doc, am I going to live? <laughs> and so I don't care if you're a doctor, a lawyer, or whatever profession. The main difference is they know some words you don't know, and it's no different than theology. All these seminary trained preachers and things like that, most of them who don't even believe the Bible they hold in their hands is the perfect word of God. Uh, the difference between them and you is they know some $5 words that you don't know. And so an amanuensis is like a secretary. Uh, it's like an executive assistant. It's kind of like uh, if you got a letter from the CEO of IBM. Do you really think that the CEO of IBM wrote you that letter? No. No. His secretary or executive assistant came in and sat down. He started talking, and he or she wrote down what he said. And then when the letter's finalized, he signs his signature to the bottom, and it gets mailed out. Now, the words are his, but he didn't write them down. Somebody else who gets paid a lot of money wrote those things down. Same thing with the Bible. 
Paul spoke the words. Tertius wrote it down. Jeremiah spoke the words. Um, Barak wrote it down. All scriptures given by inspiration of God, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, that being said, sometimes the authors wrote it down themselves. Look at Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. In Galatians chapter 6, Paul is wrapping up his letter to the Galatians. And look what he says in verse number 11. Verse number 11, Galatians 6, 11. Ye see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. So Romans is an example of Paul speaking and somebody else writing it down. But Galatians clearly shows you that there were occasions where Paul wrote with his own hand. And yet both are given by inspiration. Whether it was Paul speaking and someone else writing it down or whether it was Paul writing it down himself, both are the infallible, inerrant, inspired words of the living God. Amen. Now let me say this, that most pastors and most preachers and most evangelists and most churches and most uh, theologians and so forth, they have no issues with what I'm saying up to this point. Amen. They will all tell you they believe in the verbal, plenary inspiration of the Word of God. Yeah. Verbal, plenary Word by word, God breathed. That, that's, that's all that means. Right? So nearly all of them, except for the, the ultra-liberal uh, neo-conservatives uh, uh, and so forth, uh, those are about the only ones that would question inspiration. But most uh, denominations, uh, most seminaries, most pastors, most teachers would agree with nearly everything I've said with regards to inspiration. Preservation is where the rubber meets the road. Preservation is where we begin to part company with some folks. And here's why. They believe God inspired it, but they don't believe that God was powerful enough to preserve it. I just want to submit it to you respectfully tonight that a God who can inspire Scripture and not preserve Scripture is a God who is not worthy of your worship. I'll say it again. A God that could inspire Scripture and not preserve the scripture that he inspired, that God is not worthy of your worship. But the God of the Bible is worthy of our worship because what he inspired, he has preserved. Right. And we have it in our laps tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, we can hold it in our hands tonight. We can read it. We can study it. We can memorize it. We can share it with others. And hopefully by the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can even try to live it. Yeah. And so God has given us the scriptures. He's inspired it, and he has preserved it. Now, as far as this thing uh, with regards to preservation, um, take your Bible, if you would, please, and come to Psalm 12. Now, we'll be spending a lot of time in Psalm 12. We're going to come back to it uh, in, uh, in uh, the future messages that you're going to hear. And so we're just going to give it a cursory uh, look right now, but we will spend some more time in depth in Psalm 12. Now, in Psalm 12... It says, verse 1, Psalm 12, verse 1, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity every one with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things, who have said, With our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth of him. Now watch verse 6. Verse 6 and 7 are critical. The words of the Lord. Do you see that? Yep. The W-O-R-D-S. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Now, I want to submit it to you that the Word of God has been purified seven times in two ways. It went through seven major languages, with English being that seventh and final language. In that seventh and final language, English, it went through seven editions from Tyndale to the King James, 
with the King James being the seven. When I come next week, I'm going to bring you actual pages from a 1611 King James Bible. I'm going to bring you pages from an actual Matthews Bible, from an actual Coverdale Bible. A pastor that uh, uh, has retired up in Michigan uh, gave me his library, and part of his library included actual pages that have been laminated for their protection from these Bibles that are hundreds of years old. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to bring them here uh, during one of the messages that's upcoming. Now, uh, in uh, verse 6, the words of the Lord are, purify, uh, are, are pure as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Now watch verse 7. Thou shalt, thou shalt keep them. Mm -hmm. O Lord, thou shalt preserve them mm -hmm. from this generation forever. Right. Thou shalt keep them. Who's the them? The what's, the word, uh, what's the antecedent for them in verse 7? The words... In verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words. So it says, thou shalt keep them. Them is talking about the words. Thou shalt keep them. Do you know what the NIV says? The NIV says, thou shalt keep us. Now listen here. I believe in eternal security just as much as the next guy. But us isn't in the context. Right. The words of the Lord are what's in the context. In that passage, God isn't promising to keep us, although in other places he does promise to keep us. But in this passage, he's talking about keeping his words. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And so inspiration is awesome. But inspiration is worthless without preservation. What God inspired, he has preserved. Right. And we have it tonight. Yes. We have it tonight. The words of the Lord are pure words. A silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, or thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. All right? I just misread the daylights out of it, didn't I? Let me read it again. The words of the Lord are pure words. A silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Now take your Bible, you're in Psalms, come over to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Now, if you didn't know, Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the entire Bible. Right. Yes. Longest chapter in the entire Bible. Um, this chapter has 176 verses. Do you realize that every single verse, all 176 verses, are about the Word of God. Yeah. The longest chapter in the Word of God is about the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And look what it says with me in one, uh, 160. Psalm uh, 119, verse 160. Psalm 119, verse 160. Thy Word is true from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And you can run that from generations to resolutions. It's true from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Look what he says. And every one of thy righteous judgments endures for how long? Forever. 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 Take a look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, we see another familiar one here. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, look at verse 35. Matthew 24, 35. This is Jesus himself speaking here. And in Matthew 24, 35, he says, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Verse 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, my W-O-R-D-S, my words shall not pass away. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. You know, uh, back in Jeremiah's day, they thought they could get rid of the word of God because they didn't like it. And so they cut it up with a penknife and threw it into a fire on the hearth. And they thought, that's the end of that mess. But at the end of the chapter, God says, not so fast. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. 
And so Jeremiah sits down, Barak sits down, and they write out all the former words. And to add injury to insult, they added some life words to it. You can't get rid of the word of God that easy. Right. Y'all remember a fellow named, uh, was a Voltaire? Yeah. Uh, who, uh, who said uh, God is dead, you know? And then after uh, uh, Voltaire died, someone went to his tombstone and said, Voltaire is dead and signed it God. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he said within 100 years, Christianity would be extinct. Right. Do you know what happened to, to him after he died or what happened to his estate? His house got turned into a Bible publishing house. <laughs> his house got turned into a Bible publishing house. <laughs> And so uh, God's not dead, and his word is settled in, in heaven forever. So final authority. The word of God is our final authority. It's our final authority, first of all, because of inspiration. Yeah. It's our final authority, second of all, because of preservation. I want to say this, number three, and we'll be done here shortly. Number three, I want to say this. The word of God is the final authority because of its personification. Its personification. You say, preacher, what in the world are you talking about? I'm going to show you. Take your Bibles for a second and look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. It's personification. John chapter 1. John chapter 1 says this. In the beginning was the Word. Now, is that a word there? Is that capitalized or not capitalized? Yeah. Capitalized. Capitalized, right? That's important. Mm -hmm. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right. Do you see that? Yes. Look at verse 14. What does verse 14 say, somebody? Somebody read that for me. <clears throat> and the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, for grace and truth. All right, so verse 1, the Word was God. Verse 14, the Word was made flesh. Mm -hmm. So who was made flesh? Jesus. Jesus. The Word. The Word. The Word. But who did verse 1 say the Word was? God. So who was made flesh? The Word. God was made flesh. Okay. Because the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh, so God was made flesh. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Unless you have an NIV, ESV, ASV, because none of them say God was manifest in the flesh. They all say he who was revealed or he who was manifest. Who's the he? The Greek text said theos, and theos is God. So the King James has it right. God was manifest in the flesh because in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh. Yes. So the Word of God incarnate, the Word in the flesh, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. But what about the written Word that you hold in your hand? Take your Bibles now, come to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. They all got time tonight, right? I mean, there's no Super Bowl this evening. And there ain't nothing else worth watching on TV anyway. And so a little bit of preaching that never hurt nobody, amen? So if we go to 8, 9, 9, 30, 10, I mean, as long as I get a, 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 a preacher home in time for his night, we'll, he'll be okay, right, brother? <laughs> I'm just kidding. The preacher does drink night will, it's got alcohol in it. <laughs> and we're Baptists, right, brother? <laughs> Now I'm meddling. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 4. Look what it says here, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God. Now, when it says the word of God, capitalized or not capitalized? Not, not, not capitalized, not. right? Now, back in John chapter 1, capitalized, right? Yeah. Here, Hebrews 4, not capitalized. Right. I'll say why in just a second. For the word of God is quick. Now, the word quick there, that means alive, not fast. Right. When I say something's quick, you know, nowadays we think it means, uh, you know, fast or whatever. But uh, down south, when you cut your fingernails too short, you cut into what? Quick. Why do they say that? Why do they say that you cut into the quick? Because what's, un uh, what's under that nail? Living flesh. 
Because the life of the flesh is in that blood. What's under that nail? Blood. That's living flesh under that nail. It's quick. So when you cut it too short, you cut into the quick. Yeah, yeah the King James is always about 500 years ahead of all his critics. <laughs> oh, oh, well, uh, that word means a lot. Yeah, we know. Because we know what it means to cut into the quick. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. All right. So for the word of God is quick. It's alive. It's living. Mm -hmm. And powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow. Notice there's your body, soul, and spirit. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Whoa! Let's take a step back, shipmate. What is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart? The book you're holding in your lap. That book is a discerner of your evil, wicked heart. You ever picked up your Bible and God was speaking to you so much that tears was in your eyes and you couldn't put it down? And then there's other times where you're bored out of your mind. You're just reading because it's a check mark in a box on your Bible reading plan. Why is it one way this time and another way that time? I'll tell you why. The book is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your heart. It knows if you've got unconfessed sin, and it knows if you've come seeking to get fed by God, or whether you're just there to perform a religious duty, and you get what you pay for, amen. 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 You're welcome. <laughs> you say, how do you know that? Because I've been through both. There's been times where the word of God, as I read the word, was leaping off the page and blessing my heart. And my soul was doing triple backflips in my heart. And then there's other times that I just can't wait to be done yeah. so I can move on to the next thing on my to-do list of what I've got to do that day. Naming all them kids. <laughs> yeah, all them kids. One of them sitting back there right now. <laughs> What's the difference? The book, the word of God is... It's alive and it discerns my heart. It knows why I came and it's going to give me whatever I deserve based on what my motive was in why I came. Look at the next verse. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Oh, my soul, the word of God is alive. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there's nothing that's not manifest in his sight. And all things are opened unto him with whom we have to do. The word of God capitalized, Jesus Christ, God incarnate. Word of God, lowercase, the scripture. Are they the same? Yes and no. Yes, in the sense that they are both of God. Right. Yes, they are both true. Right. Yes, they are both pure. But are there differences? Of course there are. Uh, if you look at my Bible, my Bible is all marked up. It's highlighted. It has notes. Uh, I, I can write on the Bible. Can I write on Jesus Christ? No. Of course not. The book of Jeremiah, old Jehudai cut it up with a knife. Can you cut Jesus up with a knife? No. Of course not. Uh, when he was done cutting it up with a knife, he threw it in the fireplace. Can you burn Jesus up? No. Of course not. You can the Bible, though. Right. And so, no doubt, there are distinctions between the Word of God incarnate, capital W, right. and the written Word of God, the Scripture, small w. There are differences, but boy, it's such a fine line that I don't want to tread on it. These folks that will start uh, messing with the book and adding stuff and subtracting stuff. You know, we're going to go into the verses that talk about not adding to his word, not, you know, not subtracting from his word and so forth. We're going to talk about those warnings in the scripture. I don't know how people do that and sleep at night. I, I get troubled enough when I just break his commandments. I get troubled enough just by knowing that I've sinned against his word. Oh, yeah. I can't imagine having the gumption and the audacity to change right. what he said. Right. 
I tell you what, at the judgment seat of Christ, you know, we talked about the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, listen here, uh, I fear it. I'm afraid of it because I know that God's going to find some things in my life that are nothing more than wood, hay, or stubble. And I'm just praying to God, I've got something more than a glorified ashtray when the thing's over. But I'll tell you one accusation that God will never raise against this old hillbilly from West Virginia. Actually, I can't say West Virginia. Uh, we're so embarrassed by what's going on in Virginia that we now identify as East Kentucky. <laughs> we're so embarrassed by the whole thing, the whole mess in Virginia that we're not West Virginia no more. We're East Kentucky. <laughs> yeah. I tell you what, God's going to find all kinds of things to bring judgment for me. At the judgment seat of Christ. But the one thing he won't be able to do. Is the fact that John. You changed my word. Now he'll be able to rightly identify. Where I have disobeyed his word. And where I have rebelled against his word. And where I have violated his word. I will be on my knees. With a shamed face. With my face planted on the ground. Uh, unworthy to look up to heaven. But the one thing he won't find accusation against. Is me changing his book. I don't know how these scholars do it. But then again, the Bible says the love of money yeah. is the root of all evil. Right? You know, there's only one Bible that doesn't have a copyright. And it's the one you're holding in your lap. Yeah. Do you know that if you want to print a King James Bible, you can set up a printing press in your basement tonight. And you can print as many copies as you want. And there's nobody that can say anything about it. Because the King James Bible is in the public domain. Let me tell you something. If you try that with a new King James Bible, Thomas Nelson will haul your rear end to court and they'll sue you for copyright infringement. Right. If you try that with an English Standard Version, Crossway will haul you into court and they will sue you for copyright infringement. If you try that with an NIV, Zondervan will haul you into court and they'll sue you for copyright infringement. You can't sue someone for printing a King James Bible because it's in the public domain because you can't put a copyright on the Word of God. Amen. You say, well, I've got a King James Bible and it's got a copyright. Yeah, sure it does. If it's a Schofield or if it's a Life Application Study Bible or if it's some other Bible that's got notes and references and maps, that's what's copyrighted, the notes, the references, and the maps. The Bible I've got right here. You know who made this Bible right here? Church Bible Publishers in Michigan. Preacher, I think that's where yours is from, isn't it? You know what? A local church made this Bible, and they didn't ask anybody's permission when they did it. Right. You know why? There ain't no copyright on the Word of God. Now, if you've got a Cambridge or an Oxford or a Thomas Nelson or some other you know, Bible publisher, your Bible probably has a copyright. Yeah. And that's because of all the maps and the references and whatever uh, uh, goodies that they put in there with the scripture text. But listen here, the King James Bible, they don't have a copyright. And so final authority. It, the King James Bible is the final authority because of inspiration, because of preservation, because of personification. And uh, last of all, well, you know, let me give you just a couple more verses here. Look at Romans 9. Romans 9. I want to load your wagon. Some of you is looking kind of pale out there, so if you don't come back again, I'm going to load your wagon while I got you. I'm just being facetious. I know that everybody here is having a good time, and I'm having a good time too, and I'm so grateful that you would give this opportunity. Amen. Romans chapter 9. Look at Romans chapter 9. Now here, Paul is making reference to Pharaoh. Remember old Pharaoh back in the book of Exodus that rebelled against God and wouldn't let the people go? Look at verse uh, 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he harm. Now according to verse 17, who spoke unto Pharaoh? Scripture. For scripture did. Now, if you go back to the book of Exodus, who spoke to Pharaoh? The Lord did. Through Moses. Right. The Lord spoke to Pharaoh. But here, it says, the scripture saith unto Pharaoh. And so, I don't know, there's, there's something kind of spooky about the scripture. There's something a little bit special about this book. Uh, you can't find uh, these unique features about a book of Mormon. 
You can't find these unique features about a so-called holy Quran. But boy, there sure is something special about this Bible. One more, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, as far as this aspect of personification. Personification. Mm -hmm. Or are we done with this one? Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, <coughs> saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Notice in verse 8 that the scripture can foresee and the scripture can preach. So in Hebrews 4, the scripture is discerning the heart of the thoughts and intents of the heart. In Romans 9, the scripture is speaking to Pharaoh. And in Galatians 3, uh, the scripture is foreseeing and it's preaching. Do you realize that all of those things are the attribute of a person, of a living being? Now, of course, we believe there's one God. That one God is revealed in three persons. Yep. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. The Word being Jesus Christ. In 1 John 5, 7, which is not in any of the new Bibles, we'll get to that. We're going to have a whole message on a Bible checklist to show you the differences between the Bibles. But 1 John 5, 7, these three are one. The Scripture is not God. We do not worship the book. We worship the God of the book. Right. But you are a fool if you can't see there's something special and unique about this book above all the books of the earth. Right. So final authority. What's your final authority tonight? You know, I realize most everyone here is a Baptist. So is your final authority the theological positions of the Baptists? You know, we got a couple preachers here tonight, both of whom went to Bible school. Is your final authority the Baptist school that you went to? Yeah? Nope. Those of you that are sitting here tonight, what's your final authority? Word of God. If it's not the Word of God, what else is there? That's right. By logic and by necessity, the Word of God is the final authority. Yes. And when I say the Word of God, I'm talking about this old 1611 King James Bible. Oh, and I, I, whatever, I know it's the 1769, whatever. It came out in 1611, amen? Yes. And so my final authority is that old 1611 King James Bible. Yes. And so tonight's message has laid a foundation for why the Bible is the final authority. Inspiration, preservation, personification. In the upcoming messages, we're going to discuss why this particular Bible is the Word of God. Because uh, two things which are different cannot be right. When the NIV says that the morning star rebelled and fell, but the King James says that Lucifer rebelled and fell, who fell? The morning star or Lucifer? Lucifer? Because they're not the same thing. Especially since Jesus said, I am the bright and morning star. Yes. So if you've got an NIV Bible, was it Jesus that fell or was it the Lucifer? When you go to the ESV and it says that Elhanan killed Goliath and the King James says that David killed Goliath, well, who killed Goliath? In Mark chapter 1, when uh, the New Bibles say that it's the prophet Isaiah speaking, when the quotation is from Malachi, so the King James says prophets plural, who's right? The New Versions or the King James? You see, you can't have it both ways. You can't say that you believe in inspiration and believe in preservation and then believe in different Bibles that say different things. Somebody's right and somebody's wrong. You be the judge. But over the next several weeks, I look forward to being the defense attorney that presents the evidence 
to an honorable court. Amen. Preacher.